everybody. It's Weird Islanders, the podcast back once again. My name is Dan. No Mike tonight. He's out uh, hanging out with his family, but we have a good friend of ours here for a very, very special episode that I'm very, very excited to bring. You know him as the founder of VintageIceHockey.com, our number one favorite sponsor. Before that, he was an Isles blogger, and he's just an all-around great guy, and he was the second ever guest on this very program. Here's our friend Kevin Schultz. Kevin, how are you tonight? Hey, good, Dan. Thanks for having me back. It is great to have you back. Uh, It has been a lot of fun to see the growth of VintageIceHockey.com throughout the years. Uh, It started as a blog, really, and has grown into a place where every single day there's new stuff coming. It started out with shirts, and now it's jerseys, and it's hats, and t-shirts, and patches, uh, as you know if you're a patron. Um, How has it been? I mean, obviously, it's been a lot of work from your end, and and you have a day job still, too. So, But how has that growth been to kind of watch? Do you look back every once in a while at it and be like, man, I've, I've really created something very, very cool here? Yeah, it's um I, I appreciate all that. It's it's been kind of kind of wild. Um <laughs> I mean, cuz it it started cuz I just I wanted a, a Long Island Ducks hockey shirt and I went googling <laughs> and you couldn't get one. Nobody was right. doing that. So, you know, we figured out and if that was possible and just was like started doing it and say, "Hey, I, you know, I'll make a couple for myself and you know, we'll put it out there, see what happens." And the response has just been unbelievable. We're mm. we're going to be uh I guess next season will be our fifth uh, fifth hockey season, which is crazy. Yeah, um, that I've even been doing this for five years. And <laughs> it's just been so much fun, just all the different teams and the stories. And you mm. know, we're we're not going to make this a giant ad. You guys are going to just get a lot of <laughs> awesome history. And right. you know, if you're able to, you know, you can Google the the teams and the logos along with us because some of these logos are just really cool to see. Yeah. Um, and even just like the experience of some of people reaching out, they'll be like, this is true. Somebody said their grandfather played for the Sands Point Tigers. So Sands Point, oh, wow. Long Island. Yeah. yeah. And somebody sent me their, me a copy of the, from like, I forget what it was, like 1930 or something, a copy of the like awards dinner that the team had at the end of the year. And I'm just mm. like, this is i mean this is history this is unbelievable that 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 even exists and i know it's extremely obscure and i'm nerding out but uh (laughs) it's just cool to see all this stuff yeah no it is it is cool and the fact that it's like just sitting in people's basements or attics or whatever (laughs) yeah for all these years is is even more cool and they can share with you but and and it's just like every day it's stuff like that oh my dad played for them or i remember you know Mm. going to the games with my family and you know, you, you just, you hear so much about the original six and the NHL and obviously <laughs> that, that history is wonderful, right. of course, but then there's just, you know, there's Fort Worth, Texas, yeah. and New Haven, Connecticut yeah, right. and all these different places where people, you know, you, you hear about the, oh, the Islanders in the eighties. It was like, they were a family, they're part of Long Island. Mm. Well, there's all these teams and all these other places in the seventies and sixties and eighties that were just like that too. Right. And, it's been it's been unbelievable to see it's so much fun they were just as much of a family but without the sort of widespread success and historical you know Mm write-ups and things like that and hall of famers and that is pretty cool it's actually funny you mentioned long island ducks because i am in fact no joke wearing the my long island ducks t-shirt from vintageicehockey.com the first one you you ever sent me perfect and i love it yeah it's (laughs) great you've like lovingly recreated a lot of these logos and especially in case Mm -hmm. the cases of the jerseys like you know that Jersey people, they want to know that they got the right thing, you know, and so it's got to be oh, accurate. Oh, yeah. We, right. <laughs> it, it's got to be just right. Yep. The stripes have to be right. Yeah. If we have an extra piece on the logo or something that isn't right, right. you know, we're going to hear about a millimeter it. <laughs> too thick or too thin. It's a whole thing. And so, so like yeah. the fact that you have this wealth of, of uh, content and, and stuff there is really amazing. And again, it's, you know, th- there's a reason that you're our favorite sponsor because the, I shop there. <laughs> I tell people there all the time and it's fantastic. So uh, if you haven't shopped vintageicehockey.com, you definitely should because Kevin is putting in a lot of work there. But yeah. as the man said himself, this is not going to be an hour long ad. <laughs> I would love to, but it's <laughs> not going to be. We are here for a very special purpose. And, you know, we, we had talked about this and I, I thought it would be a cool thing to do uh, when it was just the two of us. Uh, we're not going to be talking about individual players here, although we are going to touch on a lot of players. But what we're going to do is a tour through various minor league teams that the Islanders have been affiliated with throughout the year. And there have been a lot of minor league teams across many, many, many minor leagues, AHL, CHL, IHL, 
ECHL, we're going to cover all this stuff. Uh, if you've been a fan of the Islanders since, you know, 2000 or whatever, uh, you will really only have known one major AAA or AHL affiliate for the Islanders, which is the Bridgeport team. First the Sound Tigers, now the Islanders. We're going to talk about Sound Tigers towards the end of the show, but there is a, an entire history spanning the almost the entire country <laughs> of Islanders minor league teams before Bridgeport. And uh, it's sort of fascinating to to go back and see where these teams were, uh, who played for them, whether they were, you know, Hall of Fame players that would win cups with the Islanders or, in a lot of cases, weird Islanders <laughs> who would only play a handful of games <laughs> with them. And uh, one of the, my favorite things about VintageIceHockey.com is you have the, the histories there of all the teams. If you know anything about minor league hockey or in minor league sports at all, you know that the lifespans of these teams tend to be very, very, very short. They tend to be there and then disappear. Sometimes a season later, it can become a, like a real game of, of detective. It's kind of fun, but mm -hmm. it's also I, probably a lot of work if you're trying to write it all up. Yeah. It, it's kind of tricky. Cause then, especially if you go back, you know, even to the forties and fifties, a lot of teams stopped and started. Right. So, you know, the Baltimore Clippers is a team that was around from, you know, 1945 to like 1975, but they weren't consistently <laughs> in the same league right. for 30 straight years. They bounced around leagues mm -hmm. and one version went out of business. Another one came back in and it's, yeah, it's trying to track it down. Okay. Which one, which one is like the real one or mm -hmm. are there, you know, or are there multiple kind of real ones? And you know, just again, going, well, I'll, I'll jump ahead to one of the teams that we'll talk yeah. about is the new Haven Nighthawks who, had three different color setups <laughs> over a span of about 30 years yeah. um, because they kept changing affiliates. And every time they changed the affiliate, they would keep the logo, but change the colors. Mm. So then they were almost each color for 10 years. And then now there's three sets of people <laughs> who remember the team, love the team, but no, I want that color. Mm. Oh no, but I want the black and white. Right. Cause that <laughs> wasn't theirs or whatever. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the one that they remembered when they, you know, went to the games, but that's a perfect place to start with the new Haven Nighthawks, because this was actually the Islanders first affiliate team in the AHL 72, 73. And, uh, we've got hockey db.com up here and, and you could look at the Islanders, uh, affiliate history if you want to kind of follow along with us. And, uh, this first season you know team uh, you know obviously the islanders are an expansion team so they're almost like a minor league team onto themselves but looking at the roster here some of these guys are, are would become pretty famous gary howitt was fourth in the team in scoring that year with 49 points uh some guy wearing number eight named bob nystrom uh had 22 points <laughs> uh he played 60 games for new haven that year so he, you know he played a few for the islanders i know but uh but spent most of his time in, in new haven uh, their goalie of 43 games was a guy named Glenn Chico Resch, who put up some pretty darn good numbers uh, down there, although the team didn't make the playoffs. And uh, here's one name I didn't expect to see on an Islanders minor league roster. Willie O'Ree, 50 games, yep. 21 goals, 24 points, 40, or excuse me, 45 points uh, for the 1972-73 New Haven Nighthawks. How long have you been sitting on this information that Willie O'Ree played for, for an Islanders minor <laughs> league team in the early 70s? That's mind-blowing. Oh, my God. I had no idea. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. It was, I guess, towards the end of his career. Yeah, he was 36. He, had spent, yeah. uh, he spent most of, most of his career actually, uh, out on the West Coast in the WHL. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, he came to the East Coast for a stop there. And I, I don't think as anything to do with the Islanders, probably mm -hmm. just as a, you know, as a, I guess you would say independent player right. signing for, for uh, New Haven. Yeah, man. Could you imagine if they, they like the f expansion Islanders, you know, winners of 12 games, their first season had Willie O'Ree on the roster, man, that would have been pretty yeah. awesome. Well, <laughs> I mean, just looking at the rest of the roster, you kind of wonder what they were thinking with, <laughs> you know, Nystrom and Howitt and right. Chico all just, sitting in the minors like right. guys you didn't you didn't need them yeah yeah exactly well yeah like i, I mean i think well nystrom definitely got game yeah he played 11 games that first season how uh how it yeah he played eight and, and chico did not play at any he got he got his his reps in down there he played 43 games down there so uh yeah i know seriously but i guess you know maybe they uh they didn't want them to to rush them into this terrible situation <laughs> they had enough guys <laughs> stuck there i guess but uh well, yeah, so uh, so that's, I mean, right off the bat, like, that's really interesting uh, that they, that was their first minor league team. But then, 
as we said, you know, things change. And after the season after, the Islanders moved their team to uh first of all, to the Central Hockey League, number one, the CHL. But they the team was the Fort Worth Wings. And this actually started kind of a, a surprisingly long relationship with the city of Fort Worth. And actually, after having a season with the Fort Worth Wings, the Fort Worth Texans became their primary minor league affiliate from 74 to 79. And this is where a lot of players that would go on to play for the, the cup teams would play. Uh, Bob Bourne, famously among them. Uh, Lauren Henning. Richie Hansen, of course, famously the first Long Islander to play for the Islanders, Bob Lorimer. But the Fort Worth Texans had, first of all, they had a great logo. Tried to kind of adopt the Islanders logo. So the F and W, like the end of the W becomes a hockey stick. And there's the state of Texas there. And it says Texans on the bottom. I have a Fort Worth Texans t-shirt, of course, from (laughs) VintageIceHockey.com because it's so bizarre. Um, But this team really... Uh, although they are lost to the, the winds of history now, they have quite a history. Like they, this team had rivals and and a real kind of presence in the Fort Worth area. So like, what have you learned about this team? I mean, again, most Islanders fans now have never heard of this team, but like the Fort Worth Texans were a big deal. They had a lot of big players and, and again, a, a real presence in Fort Worth uh, during that time period. Yeah, and this is a, it's an interesting thing because I had never, you know, Islanders fan yeah. for 30 years and I had oh, never yeah. heard of this or seen this. And then it's like, wait, who, who was playing for them and, and what's their logo look <laughs> right. like? I mean, if you go Google the logo, I mean, it's, you, you know what they based right. it off of. Um, and so it was really strange to just see this, you know, as I was in my, my research for this team and, um, you know, they were affiliated for, you know, five or six years with the Islanders. And, and I guess another thing I've learned too is hockey in Texas doesn't sound um, like things that go together. Mm. Um, but it's really a hockey state and it has been for much, much longer than just, you know, when the Dallas stars were there. I mean, for sure. It's kind of, uh, the Dallas stars went there because there was this hockey culture there Mm -hmm. and you, it goes back to the Texans slash Fort Worth wings, uh, back in the CHL and they had a huge rivalry with the Dallas Blackhawks, which I need to get more into it, but. Anytime folks talk to me about those teams, it's, yeah, yeah, I love the Blackhawks and they used to beat the heck out of the Texans or <laughs> or the other way around, right. right? They just have these really famous just brawls and battles. And um, and then into the 90s, you know, both Dallas and Fort Worth had CHL teams until that league, uh, you know, folded, uh, I believe it was around 2010 or something. So, yeah, it's just, it's just wild to see this. And, yeah, and, you know, Bourne, Henning, Hanson, you know, next time uh, you talk to Justin Bourne, you got to ask him <laughs> what his dad remembers about uh, Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> well, he spent a lot of time there. But uh, when I think of the Fort Worth Texans, it's funny to me because, like, I'm still fascinated. This is a total aside, but, like, I'm still fascinated by teams that have minor league affiliates that are very far away from where they play. And this isn't just a hockey thing. Like, right. I've always been fascinated by why do the Yankees have a farm team in Columbus? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. they're the Yankees. They could put a farm yeah. team anywhere. Like, put it in Yonkers. Why is why are they in Columbus? The Mets had that the Tidewater Tides for so many years. The guys playing in Virginia. Like, why? I don't understand. It's just oh, I yeah, yeah I I totally get you on that. And I don't I don't really know why. Yeah. And like, just off the top of my head, like the Manchester Monarchs were in New Hampshire, right? And they were a Kings affiliate. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, well, the Canucks um, had, uh, what? they were in Utica for the longest time, like the Utica Comets. Right, right. right. You know? But, uh, but what's funny to me is like now, you know, they're going to fly private and like, I'm sure it's very comfortable and everything to fly from, you know, say Manchester to LAX or whatever. But like, even in the early seventies, if you're flying private, flying from out of Dallas, Fort Worth to LaGuardia or Kennedy could not have been easy, right? Like it had to be just a, right. a pain in the ass to do. And I just, I, I wish somebody would tell me wh- why, why there, <laughs> like why the Islanders chose there. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, back in the day, it was definitely, it still is today a little bit, but you know, the AHL and the ECHL are pretty locked down. They're, yeah. they're getting to the point where it's, you know, the NHL teams own the AHL team and then they're all just right. affiliated all the way down. So yeah. But back, you know, you got to remember back in the 70s with the WHA and the 80s and 90s, you had the IHL right. and the CHL and these these leagues that kind of came and went and caused a lot of, uh, you know, in, in good reasons too, caused a lot of um, disruption in the sport. Yeah. And 
I, I guess it was a little, you know, musical chairs and <laughs> where, where can we even get an affiliate, right? Yeah. Well, some teams are still playing that game as we'll see a little bit yeah. later, but, uh, but yeah, it is funny. Cause now the AHL is mainly where people get called up from. That's the triple a in a way, you know, affiliate, mm-hmm. but like, but yeah, back then you used to have a number of different leagues that kind of filled that role. And you know, the Islanders had teams in basically all of them. Before we move on from the Texans, I just want to shout out one player in particular. And if you're an older Islanders fan, he's a guy you will definitely remember and and probably have an affinity for. But Billy McMillan was a center, uh, kind of a checking guy, and was on a couple of the early Islanders teams. He didn't make the roster out of training camp in 77, and so they sent him down to Fort Worth. And uh, he became a player coach down there, sort of like a Reg Dunlop slap shot type of deal. And when you know, they won the championship that year, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Uh, and then in 78, uh, he just dropped the player aspect of it and uh, just became a coach. And uh, they ended up losing in the first round. But then after that, he had gotten, I guess, enough uh, coaching experience to join Al Arbor's staff as an assistant coach. And so he was an assistant when the Islanders won their first cup in 1980. He ended up replacing Don Cherry with the Colorado Rockies. And then they moved to New Jersey in 1982 and became the Devils. So he was actually the Devils' first coach, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a wild <laughs> ride, you know, from being uh, Islander to player coach to assistant coach to NHL coach all within the span of about five years. And uh, so that was pretty wild. He had a long, long career in hockey. Uh, Billy McMillan passed away last year. And, I, you know, I, I didn't – I heard about him. I had known his name as, as kind of an early Islander. But, again, in going through all this research, I did not realize that he pulled a player coach thing, which again, if you're, if you're a fan of minor league hockey it happens a lot, especially back in the seventies. But I mean, that that's pretty crazy to, to have done all of that in a very short amount of time and uh, to go from you know, the highest highs of winning championships to uh, playing for the uh, 82, 83 devils who uh, were not, were not a particularly good team. If we're being honest, yeah, that's must have been pretty wild. That's, that's quite a, a wild ride yeah. and all around the country. Mm. Um, and I do just want to give a shout out on the, if you Google Fort Worth Texans and about the sixth result down, um, Corey Wright wrote a great article and has all kinds of awesome pictures with, um, the, on the Fort Worth Texans. And there's one all the way down. I, I'm not sure which player it is, but he's got a big fro. So it's <laughs> very, uh, very seventies, yeah. very Texans and definitely worth the check, checking it out. Yeah. We love Corey. Corey's work is fantastic for the Islanders and has been for many years. So yeah, I will check that out. I'll, I'll include that in the, uh, in the article when we put this up for sure. Cause uh, I want to check it, take a look at it myself. Okay. So after a number of years in Fort Worth, the Islanders then had an affiliate that would also become important in Indianapolis. Again, why? I don't know why Indianapolis, but that was their thing. <laughs> Same league checkers. This was the CHL and it was the Indianapolis checkers. And from 79 to 84, um, that was the, the Islanders affiliate. And if you think that the Islanders were great between 79 and 84, you would be right. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. In fact, the checkers also won their championships in 82 and 83 and then lost in the finals in 84. So like, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, I guess the lightning sort of did that with Syracuse, but like, man, you got a loaded uh, seriously a loaded franchise roster man if you can you can win the titles in two leagues right yeah yeah seriously and uh and looking at some of these Indianapolis Checkers rosters you can see some names here that would become uh you know Islanders later on Scott Housen is on one of these teams the biggest one though and i think the biggest reason why the Checkers won those two championships was the play of a young goalie named Kelly Rudy who was a superstar in a, in a way for the uh, the checkers. And he was so good, but first the Islanders had Smith and Resch, and then they had Smith and Roly Melanson and they couldn't bring him up. Like they just were too good. And so he ended up getting <laughs> stuck down there and he, he understood as far as I've read, read a couple of places where he's like, yeah, you know, that's what happens when you play for a good team. But uh, one guy who uh, I'm looking at the uh, 82, 81, 82 checkers roster here, which is you know the first championship they won third in scoring is uh, a man featured on an episode of Weird Islanders and who I said is the most obscure Weird Islander we've ever talked about. Garth McGuigan. Shout out to our buddy Phil Strum for bringing him up. Uh, He had 80 games that year, 24 goals, 51 assists, 75 points. Pretty good old Garth. Uh, He had a a heck of a season. Don Red Lawrence led the team in scoring with 98 points, 43 goals, 55 assists. No idea who he is. Did not play for the Islanders. Seemed to play a lot for... uh, 
Indianapolis and uh, played a little bit for the Blues and, and Flames there. But uh, this is pretty wild. But like, I mean, again, this was a five year run uh, with the Checkers as their new main affiliate. And I mean, to have win, to have won two championships, you, like you said, you got to have a pretty stacked roster. Like, so what, what was the deal with these guys? Like, uh, you know, the, Indianapolis too is a place you don't really think of as as a hockey town, but the racers had Wayne Gretzky for a little while there. The checkers playing across town, I guess, in the CHL. Like this also seems like a, a kind of a secret hockey town, uh, Indianapolis. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to contradict you and, and agree that, yeah, it's, it's a secret <laughs> hockey town. I mean, I know the, the teams didn't last so long. Like the racers were pretty quick in and out. Yeah, in um, the checkers, despite all the success, they, they folded after five years, yeah. but you know, you go the racers, the checkers, the nineties, you had the Indianapolis ice, mm, which right. were also a very good team. Um, and then obviously today you still have the Indy fuel there. So mm-hmm. it's, there's really a long hockey history there in Indianapolis. Very cool. Um, and I, I need to point out that not only was this team good on the ice, but they also have, um, I guess a hockey brain trust, <laughs> uh, because on that 81, 82 team on defense, you have Darcy Regier mm. and, center scott Housen. Yeah. so two guys who had uh that's right. you know front office positions in the <laughs> nhl <laughs> that's right uh gerald Dudick, I, uh greg gilbert uh richard brodeur right and they were all on those those teams so um yeah that's uh it's 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 a lot it you know if you look if you're a fan of the islanders again like th- it's funny too because like and mike and i have talked about this like and we want to try and spread weird islanders around to different eras and you know we we end up doing a lot of kind of more modern guys because that's who people remember I try and go back to the nineties because that's sort of when I was growing up my era. It is very difficult to pull weird Islanders out of the early eighties because there just (laughs) weren't that many guys that came in to play like one or two games and then disappeared. And if they did, nobody remembers them, you know, like again, Garth McGuigan is is one example. It is kind of funny that there, there's not a whole lot of them. And I, I suspect most of the guys who would be those guys were playing for the Indianapolis checkers at the time because they never yeah. got called up. They, but they did a good job down there. I mean, you win two championships in a row. That's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, so after the five years in Indianapolis, the Islanders then moved their main affiliate to Massachusetts and a team called the Springfield Indians. Now the Indians prior to the Islanders had a long, 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 long history, right? I mean, these guys go back decades before the Islanders took them. Yeah, this is this is an original member of the AHL. So you're talking 1936 wow. and really just a truly historic franchise that I mean, we re- really we should be talking today in the same vein as, you know, the Hershey Bears and mm. obviously, you know, original six uh, teams as well It's just one of those that was around for forever should should have been around for forever. And um, I, I hope I don't get this completely wrong, but <laughs> I know. So the inf- the Indians in '94 moved to Worcester, Massachusetts. Hopefully, I pronounced Worcester right. <laughs> um, and they became the Worcester Ice Cats. And um, Dan, do you want to guess which Islander owner owned the Ice Cats? Worcester Ice Cats. Um, I am good. Well, let's see. Since none of them had any money, I'm not going to assume that no matter who it was, <laughs> it didn't end well. So. I'm going to just go with the first guy, which is Roy Bow. Was it Roy Bow? You're right. It's, it's Roy Bow. Ah, there he, you go. I guess many years after he ran out of money with the Nets and the Islanders, he <laughs> got back into it. And I, I, I don't want to blame him for moving the Indians. I don't, I don't know 100% sure if that was the story, but I know he was the Ice Cats owner. Mm. So they moved to, to Worcester and, and became that team, which a lot of people – love but i'm sure the people in springfield may not be uh so happy with that one <laughs> and uh worcester would come all the way back as we have seen now with the the railers currently but uh but yeah so the indians right. do go back a long long ways like the hershey bears you know 99 percent of minor league teams disappear but then you have a team like the hershey bears that just has been an operation since the turn of the century basically which is crazy and if you ever get to go to hershey park they have a whole museum with the bears in it and it's really fascinating my, my wife and my daughter and i went when my daughter was little and uh, yeah, they didn't care about the hockey stuff, but I was just fascinated. <laughs> I'm like, Oh man. And then, and of course they, you know, they've been with the caps for so long. I'm like, Oh, it's Joey Juno. Oh, it's Peter Bondra. And like, Who are you talking about? Why do you know all these Hershey bears? Because like, they were all played for the caps and they all drove me crazy playing for the Islanders. But, um, but the Indians uh, were the Islanders team for, for a couple of years there. What? Um, and their, their home arena was like really historic too. Right. You, you were saying that the Coliseum yeah, so- they played at. 
Right. It's the Big E Coliseum in Springfield, um, which, again, has just been around for forever. Um, opened in 1926. So Jeez, wow. I, I guess currently known as or maybe better known as the Eastern States Coliseum. But, yeah, that's, again, just up there, I guess, in, in historic Springfield, Massachusetts, with the Basketball <laughs> Hall of Fame and, and all that. There you go. That's pretty cool. Um, and then some of the, so now they won Calder Cups in 1990 and 91. I think it was the 1990 team Dylan Islanders affiliate. Yeah. I think that was the last year. Yeah. yeah Cause you've got Tom Fitzgerald and Rob DeMaio. To right. Name a couple. Randy Wood, uh, Jeff Hackett. And then they became the, uh, the Hartford Whalers affiliate and the Whalers may have been the most mid team ever in NHL history, but they're, minor league team was pretty good because they won a couple of championships but uh who's this guy who uh in 88 had 116 points for the islanders <laughs> affiliate springfield indians bruce bruce boudreau believe wow. it or not <laughs> i can't L- legendary nhl coach <laughs> yeah i can't picture him as a player let alone a player getting 116 points Jeez, he was center i thought he was a he was a defenseman, but we will actually see Bruce Boudreau again uh, later on in this, which is, might infuriate you, uh, depending on uh, how the Islanders are doing when you're listening to this. But uh, we'll see. But yeah, 116 points for, uh, for old Bruce that season. That's pretty wild. He had 42 goals, 74 assists. Damn, that's pretty good. I have some sort of cognitive dissonance with um, all, all these general managers and, and front office guys, seeing them come up as players. I'm like, what? <laughs> you, you played? No, you're the, you're the guy who's been in management for 30 years. Right. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Right. It's just strange. Yeah, like Darcy Regeer, you know, I was I still think of him as the Sabres general manager and he's got like the little glasses and like a bad tie, like a night loud 90s tie on. And somehow this guy was a player for the Islanders for years in the minors. Like you you can't really think about it, but it is pretty funny. I know right, and he was in charge of the Sabres forever. Yes, yes, like, yeah. When did you play? When did you have time to play? You were running the Sabres. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Bruce Boudreaux, we all know of as the uh, lovable ice cream eating coach who, uh, you know, is out there. But apparently he, he had a heck of a season in 1988 for uh, the Springfield Indians. And uh, again, much like Willie O'Reilly, we talked about it. You know, these were like independent players. And, you know, I guess they, they weren't Islanders property technically. And so they couldn't bring them up. But uh, I think the 1988 Islanders probably would have uh, liked to have given Bruce Boudreaux a crack at, at playing. But uh, it never happened. And uh, the, that would have changed history. But uh, we're going to skip a couple of teams here because they, they had a couple of sort of one-offs with, in Peoria and back in Indianapolis with the ice. And we're going to talk about another team that we've talked about here on Weird Islanders before, the Capital District Islanders. Now, if you're like me and you grew up you know, in the, in the 80s watching the team, this might be the first sort of minor league team you remember. Uh, they had another very colorful history. Again, the first season of Weird Islanders, I had a conversation with Bob Dittmeyer who had covered them. Uh, for the local paper. And uh, this is where we start to see uh, a man who would become a very, very important character in Islanders minor league history. And his name is Robert Butch Gore. And he was obviously a legendary Islanders player. Uh, They put him on waivers. He got picked up by the Bruins. He ended up coaching the Bruins for a while. Didn't go too well. But Butch really, I think, became more of a coach in the minors. And that started with Capital District, which, of course, played out of the Albany area and Troy uh, in upstate New York. And uh, they eventually became the Albany River Rats and are now the Charlotte Checkers. So believe it or not, the Capital District Islanders are still kicking around. But uh, this is where Butch starts to make his first appearance. Talk about cognitive dissonance. Like, I know I've seen Butch coach, but like the thought of him sort of coaching in the minors <laughs> in uh, Troy, New York, uh, is kind yeah. of funny to me. Uh what have you learned about the the Capital District Islanders? Their, their goal, their logo is has to be one of the least creative logos in the history of minor league sports. It's just the Islanders logo, yeah. with Capital District on top. Yeah, unfortunately, in in Fort Worth, they got uh, pretty creative with right. it, <laughs> uh, mimicking the logo. But this one is is a straight Islander logo. Yeah, um, and I guess I don't I don't know exactly why the decision was made to do this i guess this was you know hey we will have control of our prospects if we own the team mm-hmm. and and all that um which you know as we talked about in indianapolis there was quite a, a good crop of prospects but by the time you get to 1990 it's it's much uh much different for the islanders and, and their prospects so um not quite the same star power so <laughs> yeah this this team wasn't quite as good yeah. i i remember i think i had like this was right when hockey cards were blowing up. So I have the old uh, 
the set was called Classic, and they did a lot of minor league cards. So I had like, I don't know if it was Danny Lorenz or who mm. it was, but you know, some some Capital District Islander cards. <laughs> and I, I wasn't going to, I didn't look at this beforehand, I wasn't going to peg Butch as a coach here because I, re- I remember him from some teams that we'll get to in a few minutes, mm. but I, I didn't realize that, that this is where it started for him. Yeah. Are you, are you saying George Maniluk did not bring the uh, star power to the uh, Capital District Islanders that uh, some other people had? Uh, if you want to hear a lot about the Islander, Capital District Islanders, uh, you should check out the uh, Islanders Award Winners episode I did on Mark Fitzpatrick and his his ordeal to come back from uh, his blood disease. He spent a lot of time playing for the Capital District Islanders. You know, this again, it's a, it's a who's who of sort of early 90s, late 80s Islanders. I'm looking at Travis Green, uh, Alan Kerr, Dennis Vasky, Brad Lauer, Tom Fitzgerald, you mentioned before, Kevin Sheveldayoff. There you go. There's another front office guy who, uh, believe it or not, was a player. Uh, Dave Chizowski is another one. Chris Pryor. Dean Chenowth, our old buddy. Oh, and uh, this guy, Mark Bergevin. How about that? That's right. Mark Bergevin, the, the, everybody's favorite general manager who is now an ex-general manager. At least he is as of, as of this, this, this conversation. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. And, uh, you know, if you go be- down and look, you'll be like, oh, I remember that guy. I remember that guy. Because they all came up and, and played. Uh, for, you know, probably that 93 Islanders team was probably stacked with those guys. This is the that era, though, of, like, teams starting to own their minor league teams, although with the Islanders, that uh, that would have to wait for another few years because um, in the mid-'90s, and these are the teams you're talking about, and I know these teams well as well, the Islanders then went, you know, they went from having their their affiliate in Troy, New York, which is really not far from Long Island, back out to Denver of all places and the Denver Grizzlies. Uh, and this was again, where, where Butch would coach and this Denver team, uh, which would then become the Utah Grizzlies a year later in 1995, they were damn good. And they, again, won back-to-back championships. More debris on the ice being collected. Kansas City has Chibaya, Krupa, Shalom, Contain, Emmons and Scremmen up there. Their net is empty. Taylor will take the draw against Emmons in the ring to the right of Tommy Sallow. 4-3, Denver leads it, nine seconds remaining. If they hold on, they are the Turner Cup champions. Taylor ties his man up, gets it to the corner. Roachford drives it hard around the wall. This will come out of the zone and go the length of the ice. No, it won't go the length of the ice. The horn will sound and it's all over. The expansion Denver Grizzlies have become the sixth team in IHL history to win a Turner Cup in their initial season. After winning the regular season championship, they follow it up with a cup. A great season not only for the club, but certainly for the city of Denver as well. They can be very proud of their hockey club that may be back next season or may not. It might be somewhere else. I talked to Butch Goring this morning and I asked him what this would mean to him. A championship. The guy has four Stanley Cup rings and he said, hey, a championship follows you wherever you go. You're always going to be a champion. He'll always be known as a Stanley Cup champion and now he's always going to be known as a Turner Cup champion. This was a team I remember very, very vividly. Great jerseys. They had Ziggy Palfi, who was a huge, you know, star for the Islanders later on. Uh, but also Tommy Sallow, Mick Fakoda, Richard Park. And uh, this was probably maybe Butch's finest moment as a coach, I would assume, if I ever get a chance to talk to him. Probably these, these Grizzlies teams, right? I mean, they, they were really something special. As the 1994-95 International Hockey League season came to a close, the Denver Grizzlies swept the Kansas City Blades in the 1995 Turner Cup Finals. It was a sweet victory for the Grizzlies as they became just the sixth team in the 50-year history of the IHL to be crowned champions in just their first season. This victory wrapped up a storybook season for the Grizzlies, one which saw this expansion team dominate the IHL with 57 wins and 120 points, the best first-year record in league history, and the fifth best overall. And their success didn't stop on the ice. Over 500,000 fans passed through the turnstiles during the 1994-95 season, bringing professional hockey back to Denver in full force. After eight professional hockey teams had come and gone in Denver, hockey fans finally had a winner. But the Grizzlies' success was their downfall. Backed by hockey's reincarnation in the Mile High City, the owners of the Denver Nuggets of the National Basketball Association purchased the National Hockey League's Quebec Nordiques with the intention of moving them to Denver. 
So as the Denver Grizzlies celebrated their championship season, their one-year existence was coming to an end in Colorado. Following the Turner Cup celebration, the Grizzlies looked for a new home, not only for the 1995-96 season, but beyond. The top contender was Salt Lake City, whose 25-year-old Golden Eagles franchise had departed to become the Detroit Vipers the previous year. So just as they had brought hockey out of hibernation a year earlier in Denver, the Grizzlies would do the same for Utah. The move to Utah went well because yeah. they're they're still out there today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the, the, the Stars uh, team. But uh, yeah, they had a great logo, just an angry bear sitting on a hockey stick. <laughs> it says Grizzlies on it. And uh, yeah, it, it's I, that. I mean, how many teams have you ever seen this too in your research? Where like a team, especially in the minors, they will win a championship in one city and then end up moving to another and then winning again. Like how how often does that happen? I can't unless this, this was the first one, but. I doubt it. There had to be a few more times like this. Oh man. I mean, that's, you got me. That's gotta be, <laughs> I mean, surely that's a first you, you win a, a title in two different cities. Right. And then on top of that, they don't even change the name and the logo. A lot of times <laughs> they'll move the city and they'll completely just scrap everything right. and, you know, and start fresh. But yeah. yeah, that's, that's something else. And I know, uh, a great piece of uh, '90s merchandise. It's if if you can get your hands on a, a Ziggy Palfy Grizzlies jersey, that would be pretty. Dope. Or yeah, you know, or you get a you can get a blank uh, Grizzlies one and get somebody to stitch numbers on it. I've, <laughs> I've seen it. There's a few people that have them, and every time I I see that posted online, I'm like, that is it, man. That's the jersey. That is, that is pretty cool. That that's definitely right up there. Or if you don't want to get Palfy, you get Tommy Sallow. That's another good one too. Uh, we're going to talk about another sick Jersey in a minute uh, and another sick player uh, as well before we get on there, but a couple more things about the, the Grizzlies. So Butch coached them for four seasons and then Bob Bourne took over and coached them for another two, which is also pretty cool. In addition to the guys we mentioned before, uh, we are recording this actually in the middle of January and the Islanders just finished playing the Winnipeg Jets and uh, Vladimir Nemetsnikov uh, was in that game, and Butch mentioned in the game that he coached his dad in the IHL. This is again, this is in the International Hockey League. I should have mentioned that before. And yes, in, in fact, Evgeny Nemetsnikov was on <laughs> these Grizzlies teams for Butch uh, years ago. So uh, that's pretty funny. I don't, I don't know if he, I can imagine him going up to young Vladimir Nemetsnikov and being like, "Yeah, hey, coach your dad," and Vlad being like, "Who the hell are you?" <laughs> um, also, if you look at this roster. You will see two names stick out that are not for their Islanders connections, but for their Bruins connections. One is Andy Brickley, the uh, color commentator, often sitting next beside uh, Jack Edwards, everybody's favorite <laughs> play-by-play man, with possibly the thickest uh, Massachusetts accent I've ever heard. Uh, but I think I think Andy's, Andy Brickley is pretty good. And then if you listen to Bruins radio, and I don't assume a lot of people listening to this do, uh, their color commentator is a guy named Bob Beers who played for the Islanders time too, and, and was also on these Grizzlies teams and is a guy I've wanted to get on this show for a while. And I have no idea how to contact him. So if you know any, any way for me to get in touch with Bob Beers, please reach out and let me know. Cause I'd love to talk to him about playing for the Islanders and, and playing on these minor league teams. But yeah, those Grizzlies teams, I would suspect that aside from the Bridgeport team, uh, you know, being the main group, if you're going to get an Islanders minor league Jersey, I got to think that if you're, you know, probably late forties, I would think you're Michael capital district, but if you're like early forties, I think Denver slash Utah Grizzlies is probably the way to go. And uh, any one of these guys would be kind of a cool, uh, cool thing to see. I, I mean, and you see, you said you've seen these jerseys out in the wild before. Yeah. I, I don't know if they were just fan jerseys or actual gamers, but you know, like I said, I know the Palfi Jersey is out there and it, it's cool as heck. Yeah. I'm sure you can find it on Google and, mm. Um, and just looking through the roster, I've got, um, this, this is just like a weird crossover of Islander eras. Yeah. So like, you've got Mick Vakoda on here, played 162 games for the Utah Grizzlies. And I, I think of Mick Vakoda, I'm like, all right, you know, right. that's like early nineties. That's like that 93 playoff run. And then right next to him, uh, I have it sorted by points, Richard Park. <laughs> and I'm like. I thought Richard Park only existed from like 2005 to 2010. <laughs> so it's so they they crossed paths on the 99-2000 Utah Grizzlies team. Hmm. Just very very weird Islanders for you. Yeah, right there. seriously. I mean, all all of these teams are great, but yeah, that that team for sure for weird Islanders is is definitely awesome. But that those are 
by far the most successful minor league affiliates the Islanders have had in my lifetime. <laughs> you know, we're talking about Bridgeport in a minute, and they're, they only had really had one good season. But I remember those Grizzlies teams winning championships and thinking, wow, that's got to be a great sign, right? Like, you know, that means those those guys are going to come up and, and lead the Islanders to, to a Stanley Cup and playoff glory. Well, it didn't really work out. Oh, my gosh. And <laughs> they won the title in 1996, which is peak, uh, well, the opposite yeah, of peak. Exactly. The, the Valley of Millbury would be, uh, that would be the time period there. Exactly. That's pretty funny. Well, hey, it worked for the Devils, I thought. You know, the, the, the <laughs> Albany Devils won the, the Calder Cup. Big Devils won the Stanley Cup. I thought that's how it worked, yep. but apparently not. Yeah. Um, after Utah slash Denver, uh, the Islanders, again, moved to another place that is close to your heart and a place, again, that you wouldn't think is a hockey hotbed, but has a long, long, long history in the sport. And this team has one of my favorite logos of all time. And I was so excited when you added this shirt. And I was the, one of the, I hope for one of the first people to be like, I need one of those shirts. And I have it. And I love it. And I've worn it to work and had people be like, what is that? I got to tell them. It's a Kentucky <laughs> Thoroughblade shirt, man. This was one of the great minor league teams of the 90s. The Islanders uh, were an affiliate of theirs for a year. And uh, they, again, had a bunch of famous players on it. Steve Webb, a guy named Evgeny Nabokov. Uh, and if you're wondering, wait a minute, he was an Islander before he was an Islander? No, this was a split affiliate with the San Jose Sharks. So there was a lot of Sharks in Kentucky, a lot of Islanders in Kentucky. And one guy in particular named Zdeno Chara. Spent a lot of time playing in Kentucky, and I can't imagine what a hockey fan in 1997 Kentucky must have thought seeing this enormous Slovakian man <laughs> prowling the ice uh, for the Kentucky Thoroughblades. But, I mean, you, you, uh, you know, you're in the area. Like, what's, what's that like out there, the, the hockey scene? And, and, like, do the Thoroughblades have, like, still, a, 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 like, a presence out there? Yeah, this is uh th- this is my favorite era that we're getting into, you know, with the Grizzlies and the Thoroughblades and uh some of the ones up next that I won't spoil. Just these absolutely insane logos, yeah. these team names that are, you know, the Thoroughblades, the same era as, you know, the Albany River Rats. Mm. Just these strange logos, strange colors, but just just awesome. Mm. They were awesome at the time, they're awesome in retrospect. Um and yeah, so Zdeno Chara playing in Kentucky. <laughs> you never thought that would that would be a thing, but the Thoroughblades, man, they're they're well remembered around here. Mm-hmm. They were an AHL team for about five years, and you know, I I I moved to the area here. I'm I'm in uh, northern Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati. Um, which, yes, the Cincinnati airport is in Kentucky. Nobody knows that. I learned that when I moved here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's this weird you kind of there's this weird dividing line. So we're pretty close to Miami of Ohio and that university that has a hockey team. Mm. And then as you get down and you cross the river into Kentucky, you know, there's not as you know, there's no D1 hockey. There's at this point there's actually no minor league hockey in Kentucky, which mm. is pretty unfortunate. Um but it's it's still big here and people People like it, and it's you know the Thoroughblades are extremely well remembered as you know that's where I went when I grew up, and they had Nabokov and they had Chara, and those names really meant something to people because these guys went on and were huge stars. Mm. Um, and I while we're talking about it and college hockey in Kentucky, which you know may never get on this podcast ever again, <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to shout out the University of Kentucky uh, hockey team, which it's um, it's a club sport, but they play at midnight on Friday nights Whoa. and it is an institution down there. My wife, uh, I'm not going to tell you when she went to college and <laughs> she'll get, she'll get upset about that. Um, but the team has been playing at midnight for as, as long as she can remember. And they, they get a good following and the, the kids come out and support wow. them. So, you know, kudos to them on that. How wiped must those um, players be playing at midnight though? I don't understand. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I am, I am in my late thirties and I cannot get down there for a game as much as I want to. <laughs> that is well past my bedtime at this point. Right. That's pretty funny. But uh, yeah, so it's this, this strange horse logo with horse really uh, probably on steroids mm. carrying a hockey stick. <laughs> and they played at uh, rep arena, the, the famous home of uh, the university of Kentucky right. basketball team. And, yeah. you know, unfortunately things kind of, 
didn't work out between them and the arena, which is why they were eventually sold and moved to Cleveland. But it's it's well remembered around here for sure. That's really cool. Uh, the Thoroughblade's also part of the 90s teal color scheme boom uh, that you'll remember. That we can all Absolutely. thank the, uh, the Charlotte Hornets for that. Uh, once that happened, all of a sudden, oh my God, everybody's got teal now. And I can imagine the Miami Dolphins are like, dude, we were wearing teal 20 years ago. What are you guys all doing now? But uh, yeah, no, it's a sick jersey. And and again, just, it is a great era. Like just thinking about like, here you are, you know, the the NHL was obviously much smaller back then. And, and it was, you know, kind of bigger cities, although places like Long Island and San Jose had them too. But like, you know, you're in Kentucky and all of a sudden you're, you're, you can go to a minor league game and like watch these guys and then all of a sudden see them on TV and see them playing big minutes for big teams. I can imagine somebody, you know, people in Kentucky became big hockey fans through that. And then it wasn't long before, you know, they're watching Zidane Char play for the, the senators or Bruins. And, you know, they're, they're lifelong fans without ever having an NHL team there, but like they had NHL players come through there and it was pretty good. Not to mention Steve Webb and Evgeny Nabokov as well. I can imagine a lot of Thoroughblades fans probably became Sharks fans. Um, but another team that I remember very well from this era that I think also may have had some uh, some Zdeno Chara time. I'm not even sure. I'll have to look it up. Was the Lowell Lock Monsters? Now, the Lowell Lock Monsters again uh, are still around. They're actually the Utica Comets now. After playing for a bunch, of, they became the Albany Devils. Became the Binghamton Devils. Now they're the Utica Comets. And I remember when this team was founded. I remember when their logo was first released. And I can name a ton of players on this roster because. I interviewed a bunch of them when I was an intern for the Islanders and wrote for their, their program because this was my job was to talk to the guys, the prospects, you know, cause it was like, you know, they didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. So it was kind of a match made in heaven and they were all very nice to me. And uh, yeah, Zdeno Char is here. Dmitry Nabokov is not Evgeny. He was Dmitry. He didn't hang around long that long. Vladimir Orzog, uh, Warren Looning, who I remember talking to Ray Giroux, Ted Crowley, who came up and had a few, a few games with the Islanders, Mark Lawrence, who had a real breakout season with the Islanders, signed a contract, never broke out ever again. Uh, yeah. Char was there for a few go- games, Ray Schultz. And then Marcel Cousineau uh, was a goalie. You may or may not remember. Oh, and look at this. Steve Valiquet, uh also played for the Lowell Lock Monsters for a while. This now Lowell's in Massachusetts for those who don't know. So, you know, now we're coming back East and uh, this logo is, is equally as insane. I mean, it looks like the 1998 Godzilla, it's like purple. I, what, I don't know what a lock monster is meant to be, I guess. It'll like a Loch Ness monster, but I don't, I don't know if there's like a history of sea creatures and, and sea monsters in Lowell, Massachusetts. It's weird, but I guess it's like it's my, one, of, one of my favorite lines from my favorite movie. This is Spinal Tap. It's such a fine line between stupid and clever. So like the Thoroughblades jersey and logo I find awesome. But the Lowell Lock Monsters jersey, I find kind of weird and strange. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Like, you can figure this out. Maybe is there a reason why one of these things is sort of like, oh, shit, that's amazing. And the other is like, dude, what is that? Yeah, this this logo and jersey, you should Google the jersey because there's, um, if you search for game used Lowell Lock Monster jerseys, the first result should be a Roberto Luongo jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so there are there's a number of Islander connections here. Um, I saw Andrew Ladd on the roster. Wow. I saw Johnny Boychuk, obviously mm. pre yeah. pre Islanders. Um, but this is this is like this jersey. They added every piece of flair they possibly could. <laughs> it's like a like a Guy Fieri hockey jersey. Mm. It's like the I think the colors are great. The logo is great. And then they they designed. Okay, so the design has you know like a dragon's kind of. Right. I guess you would call it like scales or something on it. Okay, that's fine. Well, then they added these these shoulder patches. It's like an L with, you know, dragon, I don't know if you call it wings or whatever. And then but that they didn't stop there. They went to the numbers, so then they had their own custom number style. Right. I remember that. And then even the lettering. The lettering is the first and last letter of the name is um the font is bigger than all the letters in the middle. And the first and last letter has this little flare on it as like a dragon tail. <laughs> and I'm just like, every piece, as, as a whole thing, you're looking at it, it's purple, it's red, it's black. You're just like, okay, this is cool. But as soon as you start looking into it, right. you're just like, what, is, what did you guys way do? Way too much going on here. Man, I, yeah, I knew they had custom numbers, but I didn't know that about like the typeface. Oh my God, that's insane. Why? 
yeah, there's there's a lot happening there, but you know, right. Zdeno Chara, Roberto Longo, <laughs> Boychuk, there's there's quite some names on, yeah. on this yeah. roster that came through there. And it sounds like they probably spent more on the jerseys than they did on the roster. Gee whiz. Um, <laughs> speaking of uh, names, you know, uh, the head coach of the Lowell Lock Monsters from 1990, from 1999 to 2001, you guessed it, Bruce Boudreaux. Once again, there he is. Uh, the Islanders, I suppose, could have given him a chance, but they didn't. And he uh, coached for a couple of seasons in in Lowell. And uh, they went to the second round of the playoffs that first time in 99-2000. But uh, that was about it. And then I guess after that, he was on to the uh, Caps Farm team. But uh, yeah, Vladimir Orzok, like I said before, Mike Watt is another one. Oh, Peter Mika, who uh, has come to uh, alumni games. Yeah, this is this is a great group. Oh, Eric Brewer, another guy there. Dan Bilesma. Mm-hmm. How about that? He was a player, not a coach. Player, by the way, Dan Bilesma. Um, I mean, these the, this roster is just amazing. You just go down. And there, yeah, there's Luongo. 26 games, uh, 10 wins, 12 losses, 4 ties. Uh, 908 save percent. Not bad. Steve Valiquette backed him up. And it looks like um, Lu- Luongo wasn't even the starter. Nope. Somebody named Travis Scott started 46 games. I was going to say that Forget about Valiquette backing Famer, him up. Roberto Luongo. Yeah. <laughs> so Valiquette was third, Luongo second, and yeah, Travis Scott. Shout out Travis Scott. Whoever you are, wherever you are, uh, we remember you playing for the Lowell Lock Monsters. At least we do now. So there you go. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, and definitely Google Lowell Lock Monsters jerseys if you want to see something that you will definitely never, ever see again. Uh, okay, so a couple more teams real quick before we get to Bridgeport. Uh, this is, again, where the Islanders started sharing their affiliates, uh, 2000, 2001, uh, Rick DiPietro was drafted. You remember, and he spent a lot of time with the Chicago wolves organization, which is very much still around again, a very venerable old team. Uh, they are, I think independent now, right. Which is where they're going. And then, uh, uh, but that was, you know, they had to send them someplace and they didn't have a minor league team. So Chicago it was, and then also that year, the Islanders went back to Springfield, uh, this time with the Falcons, um, this Valiquette, Jason Krog, Trent Hunter, and uh, somehow Danny Briere played 30 games for the Springfield Falcons, not Islanders property. Uh, we have no idea why he was there for 30 games, but uh, that must have been pretty cool to kind of zip through Springfield there. Um, yeah, this was kind of a weird era that uh, I guess the Islanders were put to bed soon enough. But uh, yeah, the, the, I, I never understood this sort of split. Even then, I was like, wait, why are why don't we have an affiliate anymore? That's kind of weird, although... Again, they, they had done that with Kentucky, but I don't know. Was there? Would, do you know of a reason why they, they did this? I guess they just kind of lost their their agreement with uh, with any particular team. Yeah, I, I guess it was you know that year of just splitting teams yeah. in, in a lot of places, and that's kind of how we got to an, an AHL team for every NHL team <laughs> at this point. And yeah. Except for a shout-out, Chicago Wolves and Charlotte Checkers. I think those are the only two right. independent AHL teams left. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of why we got to where we are because teams, you know, it's you're always you're always splitting, right? The yeah. Thoroughblades was mostly Sharks, but you had some Islanders there, and you know, your guy doesn't get the playing time. Yeah, and, you know, some somebody gets upset, yeah. and you know, it's I guess it's that whole yeah. thing. You know, you want you just want to have the control. You want them to play mm-hmm. your system. And, it also can't be lost that the Islanders at this time had no damn money. They had no ownership, really. I mean, this is the Spano, <laughs> Gluckster, and Milstein era. And uh, it wasn't until Charles Wong came around that they had money and this would have been this era. And like you said, I think Charles was probably, you know, one of the things he was sold on was the idea that, you know, you had to have your own affiliate and, uh, you know, a place to send your players to to progress and, and be prospects. And that's where we get the Bridgeport Sound Tigers in 2001. Uh, we talk about these guys a lot. We don't need to kind of get too in depth. Uh, they are now the Bridgeport Islanders, obviously. Uh, the truth of the matter is with Bridgeport is that they only had really the one, the one good season, I think was their first season, 2001, 2002, where they lost in the Calder cup finals and they have not been anywhere even close to that level of success since. Uh, but I mean, this right here, if you're, if you're a fan of this show and you want to get some names, and really kind of scratch the weird Islanders itch. I think the 2001, 2002 Bridgeport sound tigers are your guys head coach, Steve Sterling, Michael Leboff favorite, uh, led in scoring by Trent Hunter, Jason Krog, Ray Giroux, Uri Kolnick. Uh, who else was on here? Justin Mapletoft, Rafi Torres, 
Ray Schultz. Oh, Ken Sutton, the old Devil's Farmhand is there. Mezai, Brandon Zalab, Mezai, Eric Goddard, of course, Steve Pietro again, Dick Tarnstrom, uh, and Peter Mika again. High uh, slot of his own zone, Weaver. Far circle now to Nardella. He'll whistle one down the length of the ice. Getting there first is going to be Tapper, so Di Pietro has to play it. Far side, it's fired by McKenzie. And taking it the other way is Armstrong. Over the line, right side now, Hunter. Far circle, Hunter. Took a chop right at the net. Shoots, he scores! What a beautiful goal by Trent Hunter. And Bridgeport has life, trailing 3-1 with 14.52 left. That's a huge goal, and that's a great move by Trent Hunter. Just gives Bob Nardal the outside in. We saw Hunt to do that last game and try to go high glove over Nerman, and Nerman made the save. This time he does the same move. Walks in, Nerman goes down. He puts a great shot right up in the top of the net. That's a big goal for Bridgeport. There's a lot of hockey left. Now they're down by two. That's a big time goal as well. You can tell why Hunter might be the one or two players, or the, the player from this Bridgeport team that could see regular time next year in the National Hockey League with the parent New York Islanders. He got that shot upstairs, and he was about six inches away from the crease. He's not even closer. Nerman, who hasn't been beaten high like that often, absolutely had the puck quickly go over his glove. What a big-time goal. High slot, Giroux. Giroux, near side, Krog. Near circle, Krog. Shoots, he scores! Bridgeport, down by one. I was just going to mention during that, but Bridgeport likes to force a lot of passes in their power play. They don't shoot the puck a lot. They try to make fancy plays. That time, Krog just finally took a pass. Didn't have a whole lot of options. Just said, you know what the heck, I'll fire at the net, see what happens. I don't know if Posse Nurm was late picking it up. It was right along the ice. It went right through his legs. Puck drilled into the near circle and out of the near corner of the Wolves. And Ardella fires it around. And this one down the length of the ice. Di Pietro snaps it with a stick. Good battle going on behind the play with Roach and Brown. Here's Padolan over the line ice lock. Shoots, he scores! I don't think Nerman and Sott were tied at three. Well, I'm not sure if Nerman didn't see it off the puck. Went off Bobby Nardello's stick. Padolan took a good long outlet pass from Schultz right up the middle. Skated in just over the line. Just fired a shot that just took off a rocket that went right over the shoulder of Posse Nerman. I don't know, maybe Billy could have seen it better. But hit Nardello's stick or if he just doesn't pick it up. Tell you what, Bridgeport is feeling it. They were jumping up and down like they just won the Stanley Cup on the bench, let alone the Calder. If you're an Islanders fan of, you know, 20 years, I mean, you could be 30 years old and still have never known a minor league team other than the Bridgeport <laughs> team for the Islanders. Uh, it's pretty rare. I kind of remember when they first found it. Their jerseys had like yellow in them. It was mostly blue. Uh, it was a little bit different. And then, then they became Islander style, and now they're they're just totally Islander style. Uh, it's got to be funny for you too, like to see a, a a modern minor league team as opposed to the sort of you know wild west of of the old days. It must be like night and day. Like this is you know the stability of a team like Bridgeport versus a team like the Lowell Lock Monsters that's there one day and then gone the next. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of funny, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, you know, the Islanders have had this affiliate for 20 plus years, obviously stable because of NHL money and the big club. And I don't exactly know how the financials all work, but I'm sure it's something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. As opposed to just, all right. Like I remember as a kid opening up the program and, you know, would say Indianapolis checkers or whatever team it was. And I was just like, Oh, okay. Mm. All right. I guess that's, that's us then whatever, right. whatever city that is with whatever team that is. Mm. And, but now there's, you know, there's the identity. I know people pop over on the ferry to go watch games. And, you know, I, I guess overall that's a good thing, right? right? You know, you got your own team and your own system. And, you know, if people people go over to Bridgeport and check it out. That's yeah. definitely definitely a good thing. But it's, man, so the roster is a walk down <laughs> memory lane for the last 20 years of Islanders. And yeah. The coaches and. My goodness. Yeah, that's too funny. Um, Mike and I were asked on a recent mailbag episode over the Patreon if we'd ever been to a, a minor league game. And and I think he said he had been to one Bridgeport game. I have not, unfortunately. Uh, but I would like to go. And, uh, you know, it, it's again, it's just like the, they have it's it's funny to like I wish I had kind of paid more attention because I would have liked to have seen the sort of culture grow up around. Uh, you know, the Bridgeport team and they've been playing at Webster Bank Arena for a while. I don't even know if it's called Webster Bank. Anymore, but uh you know, they had some issues there, and for a while we thought maybe they were going to move to the island, maybe play out of the Coliseum, but that has not materialized and probably won't. 
uh, especially if they turn it into a, co- a casino, <laughs> which is the latest I heard, I guess. But uh, but it is kind of cool that they've been, you know, it, as cool as it is, I think, to go through the whole history and we just spent time going through it. It is also cool to have the same one affiliate for 20 plus years. That's really good. And you see a lot of guys, obviously, guys like Brock Nelson, Adam Pellick, Ryan Pollock, like they've all gone through the Sound Tiger system uh, and and they're all here. And so that it's nice to see them kind of grow up. But uh, we're going to end the episode here with a little bit of Sound Tigers trivia. Now, we have the answers because we're staring right at them. So we'll ask you, uh, the audience, uh, who do you think is the all-time leading scorer in Bridgeport Sound Tigers history? Now, Kevin, before you looked at this did you know the answer to this or were you did you could you have guessed this player because i kind of had an idea but seeing it laid out this way i I was not surprised (laughs) but i was like yeah i guess that makes sense um well i would have probably guessed it because i guess if you've been following the sound tigers at all for for um you know the duration of their existence you you would know this is this is probably mr sound tiger Mm. if they want to give out that name it's it's jeremy carlton Mm. who had 77 goals 203 points in 326 games. Man, 326 games for the minor league affiliate for the New York Islanders. That's a lot. But believe it or not, that's not the most. And I this is another guy who I would have thought would have I thought he would have been the leading scorer, but we'll ask the audience again, who has the Sound Tigers record for most games played as a Sound Tiger? Another name that we heard a lot about, didn't see him really play for the Islanders at all. Uh, again, this this is another guy. I mean, if if Jeremy Colleton is Mr. Sound Tiger, this guy is sort of like Mr. Sound Tiger Jr., I guess, right? <laughs> He's been around a long time, too. I guess so. He was right in that same era as mm-hmm. as Colleton in the um, the late 2000s, early 2010s. And I, I'm going to pr- probably pronounce this this wrong. It's Mark Wooten? Watton? I've always said Watton. Can you correct me? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty wild. 368 games, 110 points. Yeah, 368 games. That is crazy. Uh, Last one, uh, believe it or not, neither of these guys is the leading goal scorer in Bridgeport Sound Tigers history. This is a guy, I don't think he ever got a shot with the Islanders. Uh, Oh, no, I guess he did. 13 games. I guess we'll have to talk about him on some some episode. But a lot of time with the Chicago Wolves. I don't know if I would have guessed this person doing this, but did, did you know who the leading goal scorer in Sound Tigers history was before we looked at this? I know the name, but I don't yeah. I don't know why, because <laughs> he didn't play very long no. with the actual Islanders. Maybe there was a, a trade or something yeah. I missed, but it's Jeff Hamilton who scored 89 goals in 173 games wow. uh, between 2002 and 2006. That's cool. Yeah. 89 games and a total of 89 penalty minutes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. And hey, I've got uh I've got one for you oh, just here on the back end. Sure. Uh just as I was I was looking through mm. this. So we talked about Peter Mika earlier in the show. Yes. We know that he comes to the alumni nights. He did not play very many games for the Islanders. Mm. Did he play more games for the Islanders or more games for the Sound Tigers? Oh, this see this feels like a trick question. Because I, I know he played one game for the Islanders. And so I... Well, it is more than one. Okay. He, uh, it's, it was three for the Islanders. Oh, he played three for the Islanders. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought he played one. Okay. So did he play more for the Islanders or for the Sound Tigers? I feel like this is a trick question, although I might, uh, I might be overthinking this. So I'm going to say he played more games for the Islanders than the Sound Tigers. You're right. It's a trick question. <laughs> he played one game for the Sound wow. Tigers. Wow. So he mainly played then for like Lowell and uh, Springfield and Chicago, right? Or uh, I would think. Yep, yeah. you got it. Wow. Yep, you got the era just uh, right. He played 63 games in Lowell, 27 in Springfield, mm-hmm. one in Bridgeport. Maybe it was a tryout or something. Yeah. And then he was off to the Czech Republic wow. for uh, the rest <laughs> of his career. What what a career. <laughs> what yeah. what a love to talk to him. I mean, he's the guy comes over here and spends most of his time playing in Lowell and uh, all these other weird places. One game in Bridge. I'm sure his one game in Bridgeport is very memorable, but that's pretty wild. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Kevin, I hope you've had a great time. This has been a great tour. And if you want to read more about these teams, again, vintageicehockey.com isn't just a place where you can buy cool stuff. It's where you can read about the histories of these teams. And that's what makes it so great. It's like you can just look up a team 
and then get a whole little little short history lesson about them and it makes it sound kind of significant like uh i mean that that kind of research probably takes a while but i'm assuming it, it's still fun for you right like after all this time I mean, we just spent an hour talking about these old teams it's got to be cool for you to still do that right yeah it's it's a lot of fun and you know less fun now because of all these you know stable ahl teams that don't move around all the time mm. You know, so I, the, the whole era of, you know, strange names, strange jerseys, you know, the teams are here and gone after a couple of years is right. I say era, but it's really everything, everything about minor league hockey, like pre 2000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't, I know you don't want to give it away, but is there uh, anything you can kind of uh, a bit of a tip on that we might be seeing shortly, uh, whether it's t-shirt, jersey, hat something like that whatever might be coming there now now we don't know when this is going to air so uh it could be a while from now but are you working on anything special right now um well always i gotta shout out the thoroughblades it's an awesome logo we've got t-shirts hoodies hats and yes teal jerseys Mm. um so the the tip i'll give you is we talked about the insane low lock monster jerseys um i knew that in such detail because that's what i've been researching this week and that will hopefully be coming (sighs) within the next oh uh couple months with, with the crazy so, numbers and all that stuff um we we might stop at the <laughs> the um we'll do the numbers we might not do the yeah. the lettering imagine. on the the nameplate because it's just right too insane but um you can get yourself uh um you know probably uh mika on the back of a, <laughs> a lock monsters jersey if you want even just a plain low, low lock monsters jersey would be sick and if i if i see anybody walking around ubs arena with a low lock monsters jersey you're gonna have to get a take a picture with me because that's pretty crazy but i look forward to it i hope we get we can see it soon and that'll be really really neat and uh trust me if it, when you put that out there i'm gonna be the first guy to retweet that and see how many how many more we sell because nice. that that is truly awesome but uh yeah, yeah. uh check out vintageicehockey.com obviously uh all, all the time follow them on all your social medias on instagram and on twitter because uh you know stuff pops up all the time it's just great and again seeing seeing the growth of the site has been really really cool i mean we you know we've been a sponsor or i don't know whatever you want to call this relationship <laughs> we have we're, we're friends you've know, been doing this but i mean again all our the money that we've made for the shirts goes right to the center for dementia research so it's not like that but just seeing it grow and seeing all this stuff get added and seeing the history and, and the detail going in, into it is really, really impressive. And I don't know, I don't know how many people get to tell you that all the time, but it is really, really cool. And I'm very proud of you that you were able to put this together. It's really been neat to see it grow from the ground up. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. It's been, been a lot of work yeah. and I, I didn't really think it would become <laughs> what it, what it is today. And um, you know, if anybody out there is, has, you know, if, stories of strange teams <laughs> that you saw or that your grandfather played for, or if you've got a, a weird, indianapolis checkers program <laughs> sitting around just you know reach out yeah. you know it's kevin at vintage if you know if you have suggestions for the site or you know you want to share your your weird programs and and other things you have and we'll be i mean i just love seeing that mm-hmm. stuff regardless of you know the business aspect yeah if you do that reach out to kevin and, and let him know i mean and any any and all information he can get on this stuff is is going to go right into the shirts and the, the product and it's just going to make it that much better. So please do that. Uh, we are going to leave you with a couple of other teams I had on my list here that I completely forgot about. We didn't get to talk about them, but that's okay. The Islanders had a bunch of ECHL affiliates and uh, one of them was the Trenton Titans, which played here in New Jersey. And I kind of still wish they were around, although Trenton is not close to where I live, but they were around for a while. Uh, the head coaches of the Trenton Titans while the Islanders were, you know, their affiliate for a while, uh, included guys like Bruce Cassidy and Rick Kowalski, who's currently the coach of the Bridgeport uh, Islanders. See, there I go again, calling them Sound Tigers. But Titans were around from 99 to 03, then from 05 to 06. In between, they were the Atlantic City Boardwalk Bullies, which I remember also from that era. And then I remember this team I never heard of, and I think it's one of the funniest things I've ever heard for a minor league team, International Hockey League. 1981 to 1984 Islanders affiliate, the Toledo gold diggers, gold diggers. That's, that's an amazing team name. <laughs> the likes of which we definitely will never see ever again. <laughs> Probably for the best. Yeah. That, but that's an amazing that one. Classic uh, Toledo's a, a huge hockey town. And <laughs> that was a, that was a big IHL team back in the day that won some championships and that's cool. just going down that, that list of secondary teams. I need to shout out some more crazy nineties mm. uh, teams. Uh, you have the Tallahassee Tiger Sharks from Tallahassee, Florida. Literal 
like shark stripes on the jersey. And another one that is an absolute fever dream is the Louisville River Frogs. <laughs> I've seen that one. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I would I would encourage folks to go on our site for the Louisville River Frogs only because at the bottom of the page we have a, a um, there's a newsreel from YouTube on there. <laughs> And it kind of gives you a look at, you know, the team from back in the day. And it just shows the insane looking mascot, the insane jerseys. Mm. And I read somewhere, apparently they had a hot tub in the arena that you could rent. I, I don't even know. It's, it's just, yeah. I, I don't know. Whoever came up with that, they were, they were really going for it. And I That's love amazing. it. I've seen that frog. It is a fever dream. He looks like he's on something and I definitely recommend you check it out on vintageicehockey.com or at least just Google it because it's pretty wild. So yeah, that's great. And I'm glad we got those in. Uh, sign up at patreon.com slash Islanders Anxiety for ad-free episodes and bonus content. Of course, follow us on Twitter at Isles Anxiety Pod. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Our theme song is Knuckles by Bjorn Falk. Listen to more of Bjorn's music at Bandcamp and at Spotify. Read Lighthouse Hockey every single day if you must up-to-date Islanders news and discussion. Islanders Anxiety Podcasts are part of the Fans First Sports Network. Learn more at fansfirstsports.com. Try Wines from the Pinot Project. And obviously, shop vintageicehockey.com for all of the coolest hockey stuff you can possibly find. You won't get this stuff anywhere else. And so check it out. And uh, thanks, Kevin, for coming on. This has been great. Thanks, Dan. This was great. I uh, had a lot of fun just recounting all these teams. And we have to mention the discount code ANXIETY20. You get 20% off your entire order. When you order at least two items, that can be two two of anything. Uh, so it's anxiety20 at VenturesIceHockey.com. Yep. Use it. Buy stuff. Support Kevin's site. It's fantastic. And uh, we'll be back in a couple more weeks with another Weird Islander. Uh, thanks for listening. And until then, keep the Islanders weird. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.